For the latest in strategic affairs, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click the bell icon for updates. Let me ask you something. Have you been assigned an Aadhaar? Did you ever use UPI to transact over the phone? Did you use the Covin app to book your jabs? I suspect the answer is yes to all of them. Welcome to the world of digital public goods. Hello and a very happy new year. Welcome to another edition of Capital Calculus. Aadhaar monetized the identity of 1.3 billion Indians. And now everyone, whether it's the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the G20 grouping of countries, investment banks like the Morgan Stanley, and most recently, Satya Nadella, the Microsoft chief, are all talking of DPG as the innovation of 2022. To understand why and more, we spoke to Sharad Sharma, tech evangelist and co-founder of iSpurt. iSpurt is this Bangalore-based non-profit which is behind every social innovation in the digital economy in India. I began by asking about the big buzz on DPGs. After all, Aadhaar has been around since 2009. Sharad, in the last few weeks and months, the idea of digital public goods is suddenly gaining global currency. And uh, whether it's the IMF, World Bank, uh, G20, uh, or even, you know, institutions uh, beyond the multilaterals. So they're all suddenly overnight kind of talking about digital public goods, uh, which India is, uh, the uh, Aadhaar is an example. So why this sudden, you know, currency with, about the DBG, DPGs? I think the penny drop in the first half of this year. See, what had happened last year is that in September, you know, after a long, long pilot, which was an unanticipated long pilot uh, of 26 months, the account aggregator actually went live. And when it went live, you know, it started kind of doing very well. It's still growing at 52% month on month. You know, a billion bank accounts are connected to it and stuff like that. And what happened was once this was in place, people realized that this India stack vision is a reality. And what is that India stack vision? The India stack vision is, can we streamline the flow of people, flow of money and flow of personal information through the economy and through society? And all the three things came together. And, uh, and then in May, uh, Bank of International Settlements, you know, which is an influential body, wrote an important paper uh, about the account aggregator. So really the penny dropped, you know, that this triumvirate model that India has been talking about for many years is finally in place. You can touch it, you can feel it, you can experience it, you can see it. There is magic associated with it. And the magic is that it gives inclusion. We know that from bank account, Jandhan stuff that has happened in the past. And it also gives you the ability to reform all kinds of government services. DBT, of course, is an example. COVID vaccination is an example. But in some sense, the most important part of this is that it helps you create a new market ecosystem. And you know there are these three major experiments that are happening. Like open network for credit, open network for health, and open network for commerce. And while they're unproven, and I think it's still about maybe 18 months to 24 months away from one of them being successful at scale. But the fact is, there is an anticipation that one or more of them may work. So this phenomenon is what actually that penny dropped, as they say, and uh, it came into the mainstream. According to Sharad, the India tech stack vision, which drives DPGs, streamline the flow of people, the flow of money, and the flow of personal information through the Indian economy and society. I asked him to unpack this idea further. So Sharad, while staying on the subject, can you unpack the idea of DPGs for our viewers? So I'll keep it very simple, uh, Anil. So, so at the very minimum, people want to get these three things in place, uh, you know, the foundational uh, infrastructure in place, which means 
that they want to move to a digital identity system, you know, not a physical system that's authenticable. They want to move to digital payments. They want to move to a system where people can share information electronically with consent instead of ac actually having to push paper around. So, so if they have to do this, what are their choices? The first choice is they can go after a big tech player who will happily come and do it for them, right? Because, uh, you know, this is good for them and, uh, and small countries say, hey, I may even get it free. But this is no longer tenable. It's not even tenable in the US for reasons that we know. The second approach, a very promising approach is a Web3 approach, which says it's decentralized, it's blockchain, it's DLT, it's privacy is built in. And that looks promising, but it's not yet proven anywhere, right? And I think over time, some countries will definitely bring this to life. The third is that they say, hey, we'll build it ourselves, homegrown system, right? And that's promoted by the SIs because they say, hey, we'll make a lot of money in the process of doing so. And the fourth is the option that is coming, becoming available to them is saying that the building blocks are there, but how we put the building blocks together and customize it for our use is an option that we have. So what India is doing is making these building blocks available in a non, you know, rivalrous and a non-excludable fashion and saying, hey, you know, we are a country which has made things available. Our cultural art artifacts are public goods, right? And so we don't mind if our technology is public goods. Please take it. It works for us. We are happy to share it with you. Let it work for you as well. So now 80 to 90 percent of the work is done. And they still have the capability to customize it for themselves. And they have ownership. So it's not as if India can do anything about it uh, in the future, right? So this fourth approach is now a creation of India. And you could say I spirit is the DPG approach that has become the fourth option. And this is very appealing to people. So my sense is that if you look back 10 years from now and 50 countries have followed this approach, a large proportion of them, perhaps as many as 30, would have taken this DPG approach to bring this to life. And it fits with our Indian philosophy, uh, you know, of a millennial old philosophy of giving away our own public goods for others to also consume as they go forward. These DPGs are built on open digital ecosystems. This architecture and the buzz around DPGs raises the question that can India take this model to the rest of the world? So it's fascinating because in that case, when you take this DPG and offer it to the rest of the world, is it as simple as a plug and play? You take it and incorporate it. And because there are going to be all issues of sovereignty, privacy, and which are unique circumstances to every country. So how do you kind of take this in an application mode to the rest of the world? So there are two issues. Uh, one is that, you know, those who take it, who take the building blocks, but understand the coda, they take not just the building blocks, but the coda as well, and, and understand the credo will be more successful than those who just take the building blocks, right? If you just take the yoga as asanas without understanding the co context, then it's an exercise. It's not going to do the magic that it can do otherwise, right? So it does its magic only when you understand the whole context for it. So that is number one. Number two is that, look, there is a change that has happened in the last 10 years. And the change is that the Western countries weaponize their systems, even for friends, in the last 10 years. So, you know, the Trump administration weaponized the payment system against a NATO ally, Turkey, at one time when they wanted a pastor to be released by them, right? And this has happened at a rampant scale, so much so that, you know, people like me and the Indian government are, and, and the Startup Council of India is promoting to startups and say, hey, don't build your thing on GPS, build it on Navic. Because knowing very well that if the chips are down with the US, you know, that will get weaponized by the US. So, so weaponization has become a problem. So that has a consequence in our outreach. Why? Because when you build a public technology, the best way to get trust in India is to make that public technology government technology give it to the government. Then our citizens say, hey, must be reliable. It's trustworthy because that's the best way to make it happen. But if you do that, that makes it untenable for others. So EVMs haven't traveled to any other country in the world because they say India may weaponize these EVMs if you are on the wrong side of this. And, and so let's play safe. And I know it's very good, but I won't take the risk. 
So, which is why understanding this in 2018, there was this creation of MOSIP, right? As an institutional structure that parks it in a triple IT Bangalore, in a, in a new place, which is not owned by the government. It is fiercely independent, but uh, fiercely Indian, but independent, right? So, Sharad, I believe uh, MOSIP uh, uh, has successfully uh, uh, managed to win over a few countries. Morocco nine. and Sri Lanka? No, no, no. There are nine of them. And if you take the population of all the nine, there are 350 million people. And if you go to mosip.io, they have a published dashboard there. And it's, I think, 76 of those 350 million people have already kind of uh, taken this on board. And the remaining will come on board relatively quick. You can actually see the dashboard move every few days by a million or two <laughs> quite, quite rapidly. So the question is, it'll reach a billion people, I think, in a couple of years, right? And because 350 million is already baked in and many countries are in the queue. And so I think what MOSIP is, represents is not just MOSIP identity. Of course, it is important for that reason because that's very important to the global south. But it also represents our ability to create an institutional structure that can be replicated. And, uh, and that's also very important because the first time you build an institution that's never existed in the country before, it's very hard. You'll make mistakes. But once you do this, then you have this, you know, Roger Bannister effect. You know, once you run the four-minute mile once, then many people can run it. So I think we will see many more. They're called DPI steward organizations. It is both fascinating and a proud moment that India is emerging as the global lab for DPGs. The obvious corollary is that can we really claim DPGs to be the innovation of 2022? So Sharad, uh, I will actually go out on a limb and say that uh, the DPG is probably the innovation of the year. Uh, and uh, in that, India has a head start, like you just pointed out with Aadhaar and a host of other DPGs. So uh, d d d does this put India at an advantage in deploying DPGs vis-a-vis -vis rest of the world? Yes, uh, but let's, let's I, I, you know, the question is, what is the analog for this, right? And uh, so let's uh, look at an analog. I would posit to you that the analog for this is the mobile telephony revolution, right? This had actually taken root in Scandinavia first, right? And uh, so in early 90s, you could see it working. But by the time you got to mid 90s, there wasn't a country in the world which said, I don't want mobile telephony. You know, in fact, they, they were all saying, hey, I want mobile telephony as well. And, and we are at the same moment today. You know, this foundational infrastructure that has been put in place in India, is now clear to number of countries that they have to do the same over the next 10 years, right? And uh, so this is really, uh, I think, the moment in time that we are witnessing. So we have the thumbs up from Sharad about DPGs being the innovation of 2022. It is a happy coincidence that this comes in the very month that UPI recorded nearly 8 billion transactions. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to Strat News Global, hit the bell icon so that you don't miss any updates and do share your thoughts and insights with us. I am available on Twitter at Capital Calculus. I'll be back next week with another episode. Till then, stay safe.